So yeah, as you said, my name's Don. Um, I'm basically here to talk to you just a little bit about the professional writing sort of industry and the publishing industry as it exists uh, today. Um, one thing to remember about everything that I say, take, take it all with a bit of a grain of salt in the sense that there is no one person who knows everything about publishing or writing. There is no definitive way to do any of this stuff. Um, what I'm going to be telling you tonight is basically based on my own experience, conversations that I've had with published authors, um, editors, agents, etc. As well as my own experience just working in that area. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that it's not just about the creative aspect of writing. So when I talk about writing, I'm not just talking about getting stories published or anything like that. I'm talking about what you can do professionally with those skills. Because there's a lot of different jobs that use the writing process and your capacity to write, your ability to write, um, and that can help you sort of get ahead professionally as well. So there's a lot of cross-pollination in terms of what you can do with the skills. And I always think that if you're, I mean, if you're in university and you're doing reasonably well, you've pretty much got the skills that you need already, and it's just a matter of realizing that and figuring out how to tailor them to your, to your goals. Um, now, in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm just going to give you a brief inter or, like, introduction to who I am, what I've done, um, you know, in terms of my career. I'm going to give you a little bit of a book read so that you can get a sense of sort of what this novel is about in terms of, in terms of what I write and, you know, the content and quality of it, right? So basically, you are the ultimate judge as the audience, so you may like it, you may hate it, you know, that's, I can do the best I can, but ultimately it's, it's up to you guys whether or not it's, it's any good. Um, then I'm going to talk about, again, writing process, uh, skills, tools, you know, things that I do that kind of help me, and then hopefully you can take little bits and pieces from that and apply it to your own practice. Uh, finally, you know, the publishing part of it, and again, it's all very introductory, but it's basically just things to think about and be aware of as you start your journey into that. Um, question, has anybody here been professionally published yet? Good job. Um, and was that creative writing, or was that like? A, no, it's for I, I worked as a journalist. A journalist? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So, again, it's it's not limited to fiction. There are tons of different things that you can do, and basically, what anybody means by professionally published is did you get paid? Um, there are tons of places that you can be published for free, and you can pay for. Those are not going to count for anything in the industry. What matters is where have you published and been paid to do this stuff. Final finish up with questions. So I will probably throw out a few um, questions as I go, uh, just for fun and just to kind of see if you're listening. But otherwise, you know, if you have questions on any particular topic that I'm, I'm dealing with, feel free to raise your hand. Um, I'm happy to kind of engage once I finish whatever sentence I'm kind of working on. And if not, if you want to ask them at the end, that's also cool too. So I'm going to try and make sure that we have enough time for everything um, that way. All right. So, who am I? Good question. So I guess, I mean, obviously I'm an author because I'm standing here and this is, this is kind of what I'm going to be talking to you about. I am professionally published, so I have been paid for my work. Um, and that means basically, like I've, uh, like my primary, my primary interest is science fiction, but I also do sort of contemporary, I do thriller stuff, I do things that are basically just, you know, whatever kind of takes my fancy. Um, but in terms of my professional credits, I've been published by DAW, which is one of the sort of major science fiction imprints. Um, I have been self-published, so this book here is something that I just put out myself. Uh, I'll tell you why in a minute. And then in addition to that, I have edited news articles, I've edited stories for other people, I have edited websites um, for the government of Ontario, for example, where I work, as well as uh, developed training manuals, etc. And that's all paid work, right? And so when I talk about like writing being more than just a creative exercise, you know, professional writing 
includes all sorts of manuals, policy documents, you name it, if it's part of your job and you're, you're writing, that's paid work, all right? It may not be relevant for publishing fiction or something like that, but it is relevant for, for professional work. Um, my career, so as I said, I'm a public servant, so I work for the government of Ontario. I do not work for the political side of things, so whether it's liberal or conservative or NDP, I'm not involved in that. I'm involved in the administration of the services everybody uses on a daily basis, right? My particular, my particular area right now is a social benefits tribunal. And basically my job as an appeal resolution officer is to try and resolve disputes between people who are vulnerable, so people on ODSP, if you don't know what that is, that is the Ontario Disability Support Program, or ONCORW, which is Ontario Work. So those are the two safety nets at the very bottom of the scale where basically if you have no other option, the government under limited circumstances will help. But inevitably, when you have people in a situation like that where they're getting public money, there's going to be a huge surveillance network sitting on top of them, watching everything they do, making sure that the work, or not the work, but making sure that the money is well spent and accounted for. Because all of these programs are based on laws, and within the laws, there's a responsibility to be responsible with taxpayer dollars. My job at the Social Benefits Tribunal, as I said, is to basically try to resolve disputes between the people affected by that sort of system. So, if you're getting money from the government, the government thinks that you're you know, hiding information, not being honest about things, you have more money than they think you do or something like that, they can potentially cut you off or whatever. So I get into that situation and figure out whether or not there's any way to resolve that before the matter goes to a formal hearing in front of an adjudicator. And basically it's just a lot of connecting Connecting dots, figuring out what the real sort of story is and what's been missed along the way, and then getting people talking to each other. So I run mediations and stuff like that. Uh, before that, I worked for the court system. So I did a bunch of civil litigation stuff. Um, ran the divisional court in Hamilton for a few years. Uh, it's basically just an appeals court that deals with um, moderately important cases. Uh, worked civil, state, small claims, etc. So I know a whole lot about um, how many how many ways there are for people to get into disagreements, <laughs> basically. Because I've also worked criminal and family court. So I've seen some pretty wild stuff. Um, now, uh, my latest little project, uh, because you know I don't have enough of them, is I just started a podcast called Today's Just Okay. And the idea behind that is we live in a world where everything is sensationalized all the time, and everything is it's either the greatest thing ever or the worst thing ever, and there's nothing middle. Well, my, co my podcast is basically just about all of the space that's in between those two places and the fact that we don't actually need to hate each other for any particular reason. We can actually sit down from a wide variety of backgrounds and belief systems and everything. We can sit down at a table with 10 people and 9 out of 10 people will be able to have a very reasonable, very agreeable, friendly conversation. And there's always just one person who's a raging lunatic. And the problem is all the media companies, all the online stuff, social media and everything, they magnify that one person instead of the nine people who are sitting there being reasonable. And so the podcast is basically just talking about different things, um, different topics of interest, and presenting that more reasonable, more positive view of them. All right? So if you want to check it out, you can always check it out. All right. Um, so book time. So yeah, this is this is a science fiction novel, but I like to think of it as more science fiction light. You do not have to be, you know, a hardcore, you know, science buff or anything like that. It's basically about people being people. You know, the main character is a guy who's sort of stuck in a rut, had a career that was promising, made some mistakes, ends up living with his dad, you know, unable to get ahead, freezing his butt off in a very inhospitable place. And the idea behind this book, so Priam being the main character, you know, he he's kind of just not slumming his way through life, but he's basically just really, really unhappy with the way things are going. It's about the effect that that has on a person and then what happens when something absolutely ridiculous comes into that person's life and just drags them along for a ride. The kind of growth that you can go through change the idea of sort of self-discovery and 
trying to understand how you fit into a larger sort of structure and what that structure actually works like. So basically, now I'm just going to dive into it. Back with it. Chapter three, Boatman Securities. It's a little after lunchtime when Rene Caron's calm line buzzes. He's in his office, fading in and out of awareness, allowing his mind to wander and the stresses of his company to roll off his shoulders. His secretary is deferential. Her apology is just shy of profuse, but he brushes them aside. The circumstances warrant it. Linda Warren isn't someone you ignore, and she only calls when something's gone very, very wrong. As a commanding officer, she'd been a typical, a typical alpha, demanding and harsh, with keen eyes, little patience, and a, vindic and a vindictive streak. Skilled beyond her years and ambitious as hell. That was decades ago. These days, she's worse, a predator who's grown into her own with skills sharpened on a thousand hunts. But Karen is not the same either. He's no longer a junior yes man hoping for a career in intelligence. Now he's the man they call when there's an unofficial mess to clean up. Extraction, espionage, neutralization. His company specializes in what he likes to call quiet warfare. Just a fancy way of describing Unity's dirty work. Linda, how are you? He opens with fake cheerfulness. There's a nagging voice in the back of his head reminding him to be careful. She'd been a vulture in the old days, a devourer of information always looking for an advantage. You don't care, blunt as ever. You're right. Time and money had burned away most of his bad habits. Deference to tradition, or sorry, deference to traditional authority being one of them. So what can I do for the grand old government today? He's selective in which government contracts he accepts, if only to minimize the bureaucratic crap he has to put up with. But Linda's different. And not just because she's a director of Unity Intelligence with an entire division under her thumb. Lancet. Karen balls his hands into fists until his knuckles are white, then reflexively releases them. That word comes with a whole host of raw memory and emotion. His first permanent disappearance at Warren's quarter. All right. So as much of that is out of context, I hope that it kind of gives you a little, little taste, you know? It's like, ooh, what's happening here? This is interesting. Anyway, um, let's talk about writing. So when I was young, I thought this quote was amazing. Ernest Hemingway, there's nothing to writing. All you do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. You know, it's, it's kind of the, I like to think of it as like a coaster, you know? You put a little quote on something and stick it under your drink or whatever, and it's just kind of there or your, your, maybe your bumper sticker quote for writing. That's probably a better example. Um, and when I was young, I thought that it was just spot on. You know, writing is about suffering. It's, oh my goodness, you know, there's so much, there's so much angst involved. And now I hate it. I hate this quote with every fiber of my being. And the reason I don't like it is because it frames writing as painful, uncontrollable, and fickle. So once you have a few injuries under your belt, you will understand that when you bleed or when you hurt, you lose a lot of yourself in that experience. So, you know, until you've experienced real pain, you don't realize just how small your world will get in that moment. And you do not have control at all. And, you know, one thing I've learned about that is that pain comes and goes, or pain comes and goes, I should say, and so that's where the fickleness comes in. The reality is, writing is anything but. Writing is hard work, it is controlled, it is deliberate. You know, it is an exercise of your mind in taking ideas out of, basically, the ether and putting them into the there's a lot to that, and it's unfair to anyone who has sort of written a book or a work or any kind of story or any kind of project to say that it was just at the whim of a muse of some kind. No, it came out of their head, you know, and if they worked in a group, it came out of the group. Um, there's a guy that I went to grad school with, his name was Anthony, and he had a much better quote, complete unknown, and he beat best writers or one of the most well-known writers in the world. 
He said to me, and this was like about 20 years ago, every good writer is just a bad writer who didn't quit. And that's the truth. No one starts knowing everything. No one starts being amazing. It doesn't matter what you're doing. The first time you try to do something, you're not going to be great at it. Whether it's a sport, whether it's you know a, a subject in school, whatever it is, a job, a skill, you name it. I do archery. First time I picked up the bow, I couldn't hit anything, right? A year and a half later, I can pretty much hit 70% of what I'm aiming at. But it took time and practice to get there. Same thing with writing. Anything good takes effort. Anything decent, anything worth doing is basically hard, that's what my wife says. Um, now, I do have a question for you. So how many of you have taken a creative writing course at University of Maryland? Okay. Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah, so I got a question. I got another question for you. And I was talking to Aiden a little bit about this earlier. Are they, the ones that you've taken, are they mostly theoretical in the sense that they're talking about, you know, stories or the construction of stories in a way that the professor likes and they're kind of making you read stories that they like and books that they like? Or are they more practical in the sense that you are? <clears throat> Doing the work, you are creating your own stories and that type of thing. Yeah? Like, um, I'm an English major, so that semester, for the project, I took like, a program, like a French program. Yeah. It was called the Impacted, and the professor, it was basically like what you said, um, a course where we were given books that were supposed to be sort of analyzed. Um, so that was like, I guess, what the professor did. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, do you also get feedback from your classmates in those? Like, so, so you don't submit to your, like, you don't just kind of hang hang around in a seminar kind of thing and just hand around your work no, and, just and do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I took a creative writing class last year, and it was a third year course, and that one was um, a lot more practical. So I think the first few weeks of the course we spent just in lectures and free writing exercises, and then the second half of the course was person had their own piece that they were working on for the rest of the course and um, we would present it to the class and give each other feedback and that was um, really helpful. Good, that's really good. And sorry, you were in the back? Yeah. Um, I wasn't as enthusiastic. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. See, it's interesting because I've been out of school for so long. Um, what I remember is sort of, I would like to think less developed than what is, what is available now. Um, because when I went through, it was basically all theoretical. The prof would pick three or four books that they wanted us to buy. One of them was, invari was invariably their book, so they make some royalties too, um, in addition to the tuition that they were charging. Um, and then, you know, it was all just about, it was talking about the construction of those things and how, um, how it all fit together. And it sucked because we never read anything fun. Like the fact that you read Mouse is awesome. I love that. I love that book. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's it's a graphic novel that kind of, you know, they're mice, but it's, you know, it, it, it's sort of a dramatization of the Holocaust, and it's just an incredible piece of work. Um, but yeah, one thing that I've noticed in most cases is that university tends towards the theoretical, you know. Um, I think some, in some ways it's starting to get a little bit more practical, but a lot of it is just trying to teach you the basics and then leaving you to do the rest on your own, figuring out how you're going to move forward with whatever it is. And I mean, in a sense, that's good because, you know, they're not kind of handing you everything. You have to work for it. So there's a good thing there, but there's also a bad thing because Without the practical element, without the exposure to the real, um, sort of the real expectations, like in business and stuff like that, or nursing, or 
know, med school or whatever, you go on the job and you learn what it's really about. You see the reality of the business and what you're gonna get involved in. With writing, it's not a lot of that out there. You know, unless you have someone that you know who works in publishing who can show you the ropes, it's very difficult to find anybody who's willing to talk to you. Um, so, when I talk about professional writing, this isn't a sort of definitive list, this is kind of what I put down, but yeah, fiction, nonfiction, short, long form, poetry, lyrics for songs, comics, manga, graphic novels, scripts, content for YouTube, TikTok, whatever, reviews, people actually make tons of money writing reviews, doing reviews online. Um, blogs are a little bit older, uh, you know, they're kind of written form of podcasts at this point. Podcasts have kind of taken off quite a bit, uh, as well as you know content for websites, training manuals, etc., etc., etc. The list is endless. Basically, as I said earlier, if someone's paying you to write words, that's professional writing, doesn't matter what it is. And honestly, none of it is more important or less important than any other any other piece. And really, wherever you find your groove, whatever you like to do, there is an audience for it. So it's just a matter of figuring out who they are and how to connect. Um, in terms of what I've been paid to do, these are basically just the ones that I've done. Um, you know, well, actually, no, I haven't been paid for blogs and podcasts. Not yet. I'm working on that, though. But everything else I've kind of done. Um, anyway, so. The core skill set that you're going to need, and it's interesting, when I was putting this together, I was like, oh yeah, i got to put vocabulary spelling and grammar in there, and I stuck it in the bottom. Why do you think I did that? I'm curious if anybody can guess, and believe me, there's no wrong answer for this, so don't worry about, about that. You're very right. Knowing, knowing language, your vocabulary, your spelling, your grammar, yeah, it's a foundational skill, you're gonna need it. But if you don't have a work ethic, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how flowery your language is, it doesn't matter how amazing, like how well you can write a sentence. If you can't sit there and grind it out and sort of put time in. So whether, and again, I'm not talking about like, there's this thing in business or online, I guess, in social media, it's called grindcore, and it's this idea that you have to be the hardest worker on the planet to get ahead. So you show up before your boss shows up in the morning, you leave after your boss leaves at night. That's just a good way to burn yourself out. Um, what I'm talking about is setting aside regular time to work on your passion projects. Because for the vast majority of us, we do not have the resources to just graduate and then work full time. Or not work full time, sorry, write full time. There are student loans, there's rent, there's food, there's you know all sorts of expenses that we're gonna have to pay, and that means getting some kind of a job. I mean, unless you have a patron or someone who's willing to basically pay your way until you're successful, you're gonna have to get out there and you know do the work. Now, one thing that I didn't know when I started that process is just how much it takes out of you. You get home after eight hours of work, 10 hours of work, 12 hours of work, whatever it is, you are tired, physically and mentally exhausted. You're gonna have to overcome that to spend that two hours, you know, three times a week in the evenings, on the weekends, in the mornings, whatever it is. You're gonna have to overcome that to get anything done. So there is an element of sort of sacrifice in the sense that you have to kind of burn the candle at both ends a little bit to to build up your to build up your your stamina really because one of the things one of the other things that happens is as you get used to it as you set aside that time and you consistently make that time you will get stronger at it and you will get better at it and all of a sudden you're no longer as exhausted all of a sudden you're starting to look forward to those nights when you're doing the work it's like, oh yeah, this is, the, this is the one thing that I get to do that I love, right? Everything else is just kind of treading water. This is my happy place. So getting to the point 
where you're looking forward to it, having the work ethic to kind of break through that barrier, that's huge. Um, organization. Now, this is kind of a, a weird topic. It's hard to kind of frame my mind around it, so just bear with me for a second. Basically, when I mean organization, I just mean your capacity to sort of take all the little bits and pieces and keep them straight. Whether it's in your head, I can't do it, like I can't keep everything, like, let me, let me step back a little bit. If you're writing a book, it's gonna take you a while, especially your first one, it's gonna take a while. Any project that goes longer than, for me, a couple of days, I start to forget details about what I started with. And so if I write chapter one in January and I write chapter 30 in September, right, and I still got 10 to 20 chapters left to go, I am not gonna remember what happened from chapter one to chapter 12. And if I'm referring back to something earlier, I might forget what I'm talking about. I might contradict myself. I might introduce a plot hole. All of a sudden, there is something in there that you might not notice, but your readers are going to, because they read your content, they read your book six to eight hours. You spend a year, two years writing it, they're in and out in like a day. So, and so much of it exists in your head that you might not even notice when you sort of miss something on the page. So keeping things organized, making sure that you understand your characters, making sure that their motivations, their histories, um, the elements that make them them, making sure they're consistent throughout the entire work, that's one part of organization. Making sure that your plot points are set, making sure that you know what targets you're trying to hit, what you're talking about, so you don't just kind of fly off the handle and start talking about something completely different halfway through like you're talking about a theme. Um, so if your book deals with, you know, um, government conspiracies and then halfway through your book you start talking about pharmaceuticals costing too much, you know, there's nothing that sort of binds those things together. People are going to notice when you veer off and the beginning has nothing to do with the end. Even though in your head it does, you may have, you know, run off and left your audience, right? So organization is key. Research and fact checking, again, that's pretty self-explanatory. You're in university, you're writing term papers all the time. You know what happens if you don't fact check, you know what happens if you don't do your research, you fail. Same thing with books. You don't know what you're talking about, but there's stuff that people know to be untrue. If you're writing about being on a boat in the middle of the ocean and you don't know how a boat works, and you don't know how the ocean works, you don't know how weather works in the ocean, you don't know what it's like underwater. These are things that anyone who's been on a boat is gonna notice. Anyone who has done anything in that area, they're gonna pick up your book, they're gonna read it, they're gonna read that line, they're gonna be like, nope, no thank you, goodbye. You know, Impressions matter, and so research and fact checking make sure that your stuff is accurate and as, as accurate as you can make it is, is key. Obviously, next is vocabulary, spelling, and grammar, just so that you can actually put the words on the page. And then editing and feedback. So the first time someone cuts up your work sucks. I did not enjoy that. <laughs> I did not enjoy that experience at all. Um, and it was worse because I was doing it in a class and a student, basically one of my, like my, my colleagues was a student that I didn't really like and he just ripped me to shreds. I despised that person for about a week afterwards. And then when I finally worked up the courage to actually look at what the guy had written down and told me, he was partly right. There were some good points in that criticism. And he wasn't trying to be a jerk. He was literally just trying to help me out and remind me that it's not just about what I want to say as the writer. It's about what the reader's going to see, what the reader's going to absorb. Is the reader going to understand everything you're talking about? Are you making a point clearly, or are you just rambling you know, stream of consciousness stuff. So you have to be aware of that. So if you can, you know, either in a, you know, school environment where you get your, you know, you, know, you do your first couple of, of, of exercises, that's always good. Um, learning how to edit your work. So writing your work, leaving it for a few days, coming back to it, and then looking it over and finding all the mistakes and fixing that. And realizing that, you know, 
what you thought was the best writing you've ever done a week ago is not going to be the best writing you've ever done tomorrow. You are constantly going to improve. It's not a static thing. So you are constantly going to see progression. And if you go back, like if I go back to some of the stuff I've written even five, six years ago, I still think it's okay, but I don't think it's in the, I just, I've grown as a person, as a professional since then, so I've got more tools in my toolbox. Um, and then feedback, obviously, being able to take it without, you know, I don't know that there's a way to not make it hurt a little bit, but to look at it as, a, as to look at it as objectively as possible is very important. So just trying to remember that if a person has taken the time to read your work, chances are they want you to succeed. Because people who don't care aren't going to waste their time. They just will not do it. So if they've taken the time to read it and they have some things to say, some things they like, some things they don't like, listen to them. You don't have to agree with them, right? If what they say, they're missing the point, maybe you need to go back and revise so that the point comes across a little clearer. If they're getting the point, but they just think it's cliched or tired or overdone, maybe you need to rethink some of the things that you're doing. Because again, that initial feedback is going to help you later on when you start doing your submissions. Because it makes you work better before, you know, the actual industry gets their, whole, their hands on it. Um, let's see what time is it. Of course. <laughs> I ramble too much. All right. Um, the next thing that I'm going to say is you're going to need a workflow. And the whole process behind the workflow, when I say your creative process, you know, figuring out your characters, your setting, your plot, your theme, whatever point you're trying to make, your structure, your overall structure, Figure out whatever works for you. There's no, there's no way for me to kind of tell you this is how you do it. Um, you just have to kind of find a way that works and just keep developing that skill set. But ultimately, the key points are, again, knowing who your characters are and what your setting is, so what the rules of the world they inhabit are, making sure those are consistent, making sure that you understand where the story starts and where it goes, you know, what is the underlying theme, whether it's sexism, racism, you know, if you're talking about social justice issues, whether it's money, whether it's power, whether it's relationships, whether it's whatever, okay? Whatever the underlying theme is, make sure you understand that before you get going. And then point, point is more important, like, I mean, plot and theme are kind of the same thing, but point is more for when you're working in a professional environment and you're producing like a manual or a training manual. What are you trying to do with this document? What is its purpose? And then making sure that it hits the mark. So if you're if you're looking at skill transfer, where you're literally trying to teach a new employee the skill and give them something to look at later on so that they understand what it is that they have to do, and they don't have to ask 10,000 questions every time that they try to do something, you know, you have to make sure that your document's clear. Um, and then structure obviously is just what makes sense to you in terms of how you deliver your information. So, you know, is it linear? Does it jump around all over the place between different characters and different settings? Is it out of order in terms of time? Or is it, you know, whatever, a combination of all of those things, right? It's whatever works for you and whatever you're doing. Uh, obviously knowing your genre, so making sure that you understand how, like if you're writing in science fiction, or fantasy, or contemporary, or romance, or horror, or whatever, there are conventions. How long is it? You have, to have, you have to hit the right word count. For most first time authors, it's anywhere between, I don't know, 80 to 120,000 words roughly. You know, Usually, um, 80 is on the low end. They probably want it closer to 100,000. They do not want anything longer than 120,000. The reason is cost, how much it costs to print your book versus how much, how much, how much, basically what it means is how much it costs for them to print your book directly affects how much money they make off. So how much money they get on return for each sale, whether or not they're gonna break even or not. New authors rarely break even. That's why as the industry has shrunk, they are getting less and less new authors on the market. It's because they don't know if they're gonna make their money back. So that's why everything's sequels now. And 
series. You know, everything's a ten book or ten movie or ten whatever thing. It's just they constantly keep, keep pumping out the same thing because it makes money. That's what they're doing. Anyway, so if you know pacing tropes, the, the sort of conventions, and also what is out of fashion. So after a certain period of time, enough books have been written in a certain area and a certain topic in a certain way that a trope or a pacing, like a convention becomes tired, becomes cliche. No one wants to read those books anymore. So if you can recognize what's starting to get stale, you can avoid it. If it's not in your book, guess what? It's one less reason for them to reject your manuscript. All right, now, what do I do? Ta-da! <laughs> I basically take an idea, a theme, I think about it a bit, I brainstorm, and then I try to flesh it out. I like lists, I like having, you know, actual physical copies of things because, again, my memory sucks and I can't remember things, so I like to flesh things out and map my plot and that type of thing. There's two kinds of writers, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this before, there's there's planners and there's pantsers. Have you guys ever heard of that? I've heard something similar. Something similar, yeah. So yeah. planners are people who basically plan things. Pantsers are people who just fly by the seat of their pants. They don't plan, they just write whatever. I do both. I started out as a pantser because I was just, I had all of these ideas and I needed to get them out. And so I ended up with a lot of disconnected scenes that were cool, that would make cool movie posters. There's nothing else to it because I didn't have the capacity to put things together from beginning to end. So I have like thousands of moments in time that are really great. That's all I ever produced being a pantser. Now, is it possible to produce a complete work? Absolutely. But I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I really don't. So what do I do? I do what works for me. I plan it out. That way I have map that I can follow, and then in each of those instances, I can fly by the seat of my pants and create what I want to create within that structure, <clears throat> right? So I always kind of set limits for myself. Um, after the plot mapping and fleshing out of the characters and all the rest of it, I do the writing and the editing, obviously, and then the publishing and advertising. So it's pretty much a linear process. Um, now, having said that, writing and editing and you know, going back to the fleshing out and the plot map, Sometimes things don't work. I've, I've written 20, 30,000 words you know, into a story and realized I have to go back 10,000 words. I've gone to the 100,000 word point and realized half the book sucks. Shop it in half, toss one half, and start over. So it is a cyclical, there's a cyclical relationship. Don't be afraid to adapt if it's not working. I tried, there's a book I tried to write, I never finished it. About three quarters of the way through, I realized I was tired of the concept, and I just didn't care anymore. And I tried to force it, I tried to finish it, force it, force it, force it, I just kept coming up with crap. And so eventually I was just like, okay, I gotta go back. And so what I did is I actually took part of the second, like part of the second half of the book, and I put it over here, and the first part of the book, and I put it over here, and they became two separate stories. So I had to go back and flesh things out and totally re rewrite everything. And so little bits and pieces are actually in here, you know? So nothing, nothing that you write is a waste, even if you're not gonna use it, even if you're cutting it, it might be useful in something else once you re rewrite it and redraft with it. Now, when I said I like to make lists, this is what I'm talking about. So, you know, this is just like, you can use anything for this. You can use a spreadsheet, a Word document, PowerPoint, whatever, um, you're literally just creating a map of, you know, your chapter titles and then what's happening in those chapters. So the key points, right? What's, and it could just be as simple as, you know, introducing the main character, setting the scene, identifying where you are, giving people a sense of place and atmosphere and going from there. I like that. But again, that's not how everybody works. Some people like to be right in the middle of a sentence, in the middle of action. You know, two people are in a fight, you have no idea why. And then slowly the details come in. There's tons of different ways you can start a story, it doesn't matter. The point is, 
whatever works for you, you know, put it down, get it organized, and then you can start producing. So this is just a rough draft of something that I'm kind of playing with right now. And again, it's just slightly longer form of those little table columns. It's just spreading them out, getting more detail, going on and on and on and on. And eventually, like this document, this is only like the first like eight pages or whatever of it, but like this is probably like 60 pages long, you know, and that's just the outline. So the actual book is probably going to be about three to four hundred pages long. So in the process of fleshing it out and laying that foundation, you're actually doing a lot of the work already, which means it gets a lot easier. And it slowly, it breaks things up into manageable chunks. If you start with chapter one and then you've got nothing else beyond that, and it's 400 pages of blank text, like there's nothing there, that's a little daunting. Right? But if you get little little chunks as you go and you start filling things in, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I might actually finish this. So that's why I kind of plan ahead. It helps me visualize what's happening, but it also reminds me that the end is in sight because every time I write a page, the document stretches, you know? And it's nice when I'm writing here. There it is. If I'm writing there. So I'm writing on page number two, and the last page keeps getting further and further away. <laughs> You know, makes me feel better. But again, that's just a quirk of my psychology. That might mean nothing to you. You might think this is total crap. That's cool. Whatever works for you is the most important thing. All right? Tools are basic. Your software, whether you use MS Word, Scrivener, Grammarly, whatever, no one cares. Publishers don't care anymore. They used to like Word or Word Perfect or whatever. As long as you're following their formatting guidelines, it doesn't matter what you use. So use what you're comfortable with. Um, there's open office, Google Docs, etc. You know, there's tons of options for free. Um, hardware, laptops are good because you can take them anywhere. You can work on things wherever you are. Desktop, you know, they're kind of nice if you like to work in one spot. You know, a lot of people have sort of offices. I don't know if you guys do yet. You might be a little young for that yet. But as you get older, you like, you get boring, and it's nice to have that little one spot with kind of your, you know, your, your coffee goes here. Is comfortable, and you've got the music that you like on, and you've got the books around you that you like, and no one bothers you. You're sitting there. <laughs> so, environment is really important. Um, but honestly, there's so many different ways that you can write. You can use your phone. There are people who have literally written entire novels on their phone with their thumbs. Um, I, I actually have a digital pen that I use, so if I want to do notes and I'm not particularly fond of typing one day. Um, I'll take the digital pen, I'll write in a scribbler, and I'll just convert it to uh, I'll convert it to, to text later. You can even use a typewriter if you want to. I wouldn't recommend it because you have to scan it and then do a whole bunch of fun stuff to convert it into actual text, so it's more trouble than it's worth. But these days, dictation is amazing. Um, so if you, you know, I'll talk about this in a second, but if you get injured, so if the carpal tunnel starts getting you, um, you can switch how you do things a little bit and still be productive. Now, this is something I wish we would have focused on a lot more when I was younger. I think they're focusing on a little bit more now. Self-care. As you age, you get injured. I'm in my early 40s and I feel like a very old man. I have bilateral myofascial issues from my neck to my fingertips back problems, I got leg problems, ankle problems, everything's breaking down. All my joints are jacked up, okay? I've been typing for 30, three years since I was 10 years old. Most people work 30 years or retire. I'm still 20 years away from that, but I've had an entire career's worth of typing on my body already. That means my hands don't work so well anymore. So, earlier you understand ergonomics and get them involved in your work process, the better. You will save your joints, you'll save your arms, you'll save your hands, you'll feel better, and you will, you will do less damage to yourself. Stretching, exercise, hugely important. Writing is a job. Whether you're getting paid for it or not, if you want to do it professionally, it's basically a job. Just like going to work, 
taking care of your body, making sure you're in shape, at least. And I don't, I don't mean like, you know, gym shape or Instagram shape. I mean just reasonable shape. Can you walk a couple of kilometers and not die? Yes, you're good. Um, that's what I'm talking about. But also stretching, making sure that you're, you're limber, making sure that you are, um, you're getting blood flow in your arms, your legs, your fingers, that type of thing. That's, that's really good. Uh, workspace, obviously, I like neat and tidy, but I'm terrible at it, so I tend to have like a series of empty coffee cups on my desk, you know? Whatever you're comfortable with, but basically, you know, treat it like a professional workspace, and you'll be more productive. If you treat it like a garbage dump, you're never going to find anything there, and you're not going to be comfortable. Um, that's just my opinion, so, you know, whatever. Food, obviously, the most... The, Another thing that I didn't realize, when I was your age, I lived in, almost entirely on craft dinner and pizza. And I felt crappy because of it. Introduce a few vegetables into your life. <laughs> Does wonders for everything. Um, no, but really, the quality of the food that you eat, right? If you're eating garbage, your body doesn't do as well. So if you're eating junk food all the time, it's yummy because it's designed to it doesn't give you the necessary energy that you're going to use in all of this. Plus, you kind of get a bit of a brain fog, or at least I find I do. And I get a lot of headaches when I have like either too much caffeine, too much sugar, too much oil, that type of stuff. So it can actually affect you in ways that you're not really, you're not really, really aware of. And then finally, socializing and fun, make sure you're getting out and having a good time every now and again so that you realize, you, you remember what's important in life. And also, those experiences with other people food for your writing. And it doesn't mean like, I don't mean like you get after you go out and party. What I mean is whatever's comfortable for you. If that means sitting in a coffee shop and watching people and just seeing how they interact, that's cool too. It means video games, that's cool. Whatever it is, just do something that you enjoy because that's going to give you sort of those positive chemicals and that's going to help you stay motivated to do the work. All right. Oh, God, where am I? Okay. Um... I think I've said this already, you know, there's no right answer. You already have this, the right skills and tools. It's just a matter of putting them together. Um, find out what works for you and develop that methodology or methodology. And then obviously the more the know, the more you know, the more you progress. So there's there's nothing quite like the amount of information that's available at your fingertips at any given time on your phone, on your computer, whatever. It's amazing what you can learn just by typing in questions into Google and then just going down that rabbit hole. Um, but in terms of your sort of your writing skill, if you're reading inside and outside of your genre, you are creating sort of linkages that you can use to um, do cross pollination. So if you look online and you see people advertising their books, oh, it's this crossed with this. That's what they're doing. They're taking two genres that aren't normally seen together and they're mashing them together into something new. And publishers right now love that. They love, you know, Argyle right now uh, is a spy movie, a comedy, you know, probably some sort of, a, I haven't seen it yet, but I think it's like a romantic thing as well. So there's so many different elements in that. It's like James Bond meets whatever, right? So there's a reason those things are going to do well. Um, it's because the more sort of I's you dot and T's you cross, the broader the appeal broader the spectrum of your audience. All right, and then obviously practice and revise, edit and cut. Okay, writing shouldn't be solitary, so that means if you can, get yourself a mentor or a colleague who can help you along the way. You help them, they help you. Mentors teach, you learn, you know, you can kind of support each other that way. You can be a beta reader or something like that. Colleagues, you're both coming up at the same time. You're helping each other develop your ideas and that type of thing. Um, if you can, get into groups like this one. Classes, do exercises in terms of like writing exercises, prompts, stuff like that. Go to conventions, so if whatever subculture you're involved in, whatever fandom you're involved in, get into that space, see what people are doing. Because who you know matters, and what you know of them, and what they're doing matters. You know, um, it's just it's just sort of part of the research part. 
You need to know who's buying what you're trying to sell. Now, a word on diversity. So, um, publishing is moving in a really positive direction right now, I think. Diversity is one of the best and most exciting parts of publishing. So, there are so many isms out there that negatively affect people, um, that hurt, uh, you know, that, that have disadvantaged whole swaths of the population. And what has happened in publishing is that they have realized that the old way of doing business, where they were selling to one group, so basically they had a bunch of straight white men writing books, and they had a bunch of straight white men buying. And about 50 years ago, that market hit its peak. And it's been going downhill ever since. Publishers are after money. They are after new markets. They are after new opportunities. They are after new sales, because that's what keeps their business afloat. If white dudes are no longer buying, who is? Women, people of color, people of different races, religions, orientations, ages, whatever. They have realized that there is a lot of untapped market potential in people who don't look like them. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Because what happens is that opens doors for people who normally wouldn't get the opportunity. You know, if you look at publishing 50 years ago, it was a lot of me, and not a lot of anything else. Now it's almost completely different. Um, well, it's not almost completely, it's not completely different, but you know, inroads have been made, which is good. But the main thing, the, the reason I think it's the best, it's not, it's not the economic part, it's, it's the second point up there. New stories from new voices gives us a much richer landscape, you know, a much richer storytelling experience. And the more ideas we get from more different types of people, and the more sort of cross-pollination between authors we get over time, the better all of the work gets, the more representative, and the more just wholesome and universal it becomes. So in my mind, it's a wonderful thing. And what you're seeing now is you're seeing authors who either don't agree or who aren't interested in that, they're starting to get phased out. And it's not necessarily because, you know, of their belief systems, because no one's buying their stuff. And that's really a money talks, that's, that's the industry. So that is the future, and I think it's a good future, and I think it's the right way to go. Now, if you're someone like me, how do I write about stuff like that, right? I'm not, I'm not representative of any of those things, right? So how do I respectfully write about things that I'm not a part of, you know? That's something that as an author, you need to prepare to answer. Because someone's gonna have a problem. Doesn't matter how respectful you are, it doesn't matter whether you're an ally or whatever. If I'm writing about a main character who is, for example, just like a, a black dude, right? Who's, you know, doing a bunch of stuff and experiencing the hardships that are associated with that in our culture. And I appear somewhere at a convention and I'm talking about it and someone says, what the hell are you doing? Why are you telling this story? Who are you to tell my story? You know, you don't know what you're talking about. As an author, I have to be ready to answer for that. And the way you answer for it is not by attacking the person asking the question, it's by acknowledging the choices that you made and why you made them and why it's important to tell the story you chose to tell, even though you may not be directly involved in it. Because maybe you're tangentially involved. You know, maybe you have seen things or learned things along the way, and you think it's important that that story be told so that more stories like that get told. You know, that more people have an opportunity to tell those stories from a more authentic place. There's tons of different ways that you can approach it. Um, anyway. That's the end of the first part. I'll talk about publishing in a little bit. I think food's probably outside waiting. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs>
Yay!